Okay, so let's go back to our lecture. I will share the screen. Yeah, so during the last lecture, we discussed the Schwarzschild solution. We derived its form. And then after that, uh, we described its basic properties, uh, derived the uh, derived the relation between so-called Schwarzschild radius and mass. And then we uh, we have made a small qualitative discussion of the geodesics in this metric or the possible types of motions of massive and massless particles. Uh, so there was, we basically reduced the problem uh, to a one dimensional problem in the radial direction. And based on that, we were able to reduce the problem to a first order ODE with a potential. The equation looks exactly like an equation for uh, a particle in a one dimensional potential. And we managed to make a discussion. It turned out that unlike the Keplerian problem, uh, particles with too little angular momentum or too much energy with respect to their angular momentum can fall directly into the black hole or the body represented by the Schwarzschild solution. There is no infinite potential bar barrier preventing this from happening. Uh, other than that, for, for uh, we also found out that far away from the body, uh, the shape of the potential is not very different from Keplerian, and we have the same type of elliptic or almost elliptic and uh, circular orbits. Okay, and then after that, after that, we started discussing, let me share the screen again, this time here. And after that, we talked about the, we have talked about the uh, perihelion precession. So, uh, far away from the source, far away from, from the origin, the uh, the bound orbits look pretty much like the Keplerian ones, but not quite. What happens is that the orbit looks like, a, like an ellipse whose major axis or minor axis seems to slowly rotate uh, with each completed orbital period. Uh, or to put it differently, the orbits don't close up exactly. The orbit reaches a uh, perihelion or the moment of near of closest approach to the central uh, body or to the center uh, at some angle. And after the orbit is completed, it reaches the same point, but at a slightly different angle. And this is one of important classical results of general relativity dating back already to Einstein, who derived the first for the first time the formula for this uh, effect and found out that actually this effect explained very nicely the behavior of uh, the planet Mercury. Uh, we have already made a couple of steps towards that. Um, so the starting point, the, the basic idea of the, uh, of the derivation is the following. The starting point is the equations of motions. Just a second, let me, let me perhaps switch on the pointer. Now which things should be a bit more visible. Yeah, so the starting point is the equations of motion, which by the way, look almost like the Keplerian equations of motion plus an irrelevant constant and a relativistic term, which we'll, we will uh, treat as a small perturbation. Now, the problem of perihelion precession is basically the problem of trajectory, not the motion itself. So it's enough to work with the trajectory equation R as the, as the uh, function of this polar angle phi. And we derive the equations for the R of phi, uh, starting from the equation over here. That's fairly easy. It has a similar form. Uh, the square of the first derivative of R is given by a polynomial in terms of R. And now the next step is not so obvious, but it's known already from the Keplerian problem that the substitution of W equal to one over R times an appropriate scaled variable. Uh, so P is a parameter we, we of dimension length made of angular momentum and other constants of motion. Well, if you perform the substitution, uh, the, the, the variable we are using here is dimensionless. And for this dimensionless variable, we get this equation over here. Again, the square of the derivative is supposed to be equal and polynomial, but this time of order three. And there is a constant term in the end. 
So again, this equation has the form of an equation for uh, for a particle in one dimensional potential where W is the position, dimensionless position. Uh, in the next step, we can pass directly. So this is the first order of the for dW over d phi. It looks a bit like the uh, potential for a harmonic oscillator plus an additional term, but uh, it's a, a bit easier uh, to work with the uh, with the second order form of this equation. So we differentiate again with respect to phi. This kills this term over here, and we get this a very nice, very pleasant form of this equation. So without this perturbing term, epsilon, this is exactly the counterpart of this term over here. Uh, this is a harmonic oscillator with period two pi uh, with a constant driving term. Uh, and then we've got a perturbation, which is equal to W squared, scaled by the ratio between GM, pretty much the Schwarzschild radius, and P, which is a quantity which measures roughly the size of this ellipse. Okay. Uh, this is very nice. It means that we have reduced a rather complicated problem uh, to the problem of a harmonic oscillator with a perturbation, which looks much simpler than what we have up here. Uh, with the help of a couple of clever substitutions. Uh, now the next step is to derive the form of this solution uh, with the with a finite perturbation. But when you think for a while, uh, you'll immediately notice that actually we don't need the form of the solution so much as we need simply the updated period of the solution. So without the the perturb perturbative term. Uh, the solution we get is basically a periodic function, a combination of constant and cosine or sine. Uh, and if we add a small small perturbation, we'll lose this beautiful form. But the periodicity, periodicity should should still be be valid. The equation should still be the result should still be periodic. Uh, however, the period will in general change. But it is exactly this period which encodes the effect we we are after. So the precession angle itself is obviously related to the period of, of this oscillator. And here, I mean the period in the, uh, in the angle phi. The, uh, why is it so? Well, without the perturbation, this period is two pi. So after completing a whole uh, loop of its orbit, the uh, solution returns to its previous value. So R returns, for example, to its minimal value. So if W has a maximum as a, per, as a periodic function, then this corresponds to the minimum of R. Uh, this minimum is attained after two pi because this is the period of, of, of this oscillator. And this corresponds to exactly the same point. But if this period changes a little bit, uh, then this minimal value, the perihelion will be attained after a slightly different angle. And the difference between this angle and two pi will exactly encode our uh, precession uh, perihelion precession angle. So in the end, what we are really after is not so much the exact solution of this perturbed equation, but rather uh, the change of the period because of the appearance of this term here. And this is exactly what we will do now. We'll try to calculate the change of the period of the solution in the presence of this term. Uh, was this clear? Okay, I hope it was. So let's go to the next page. So there's a very quick method of uh, obtaining the, the uh, change of period called the poincare lindstedt method. It's not necessary in this problem, but somehow it leads to the solution very quickly and it's also very elegant. So a part of the reason why you attend lectures of this kind is that you want to make yourself familiar with uh, various methods of theoretical physics, and this is one of them. So let's begin. So here is our equation. W second derivative of W is one minus W plus epsilon W squared. So we treat this perturbatively. We begin with the zero to order solution. So W is equal to W zero plus a linear perturbation W one. 
uh, we plug this into here and the zeroth order term equation is just w0 is one minus w0. Uh, okay, and this has a simple solution. Uh, we've got oscillations around the value of one. And I will write this in the following way. E is the amplitude of the oscillations, and I choose the cosine function. Uh, in a more general situation, we could use, we could parameterize the solution this way, uh, but the choice of phi zero is nothing but the choice of the orientation of the elliptic Keplerian orbit, and there is no loss of generality in assuming that uh, the uh, that the perihelion happens at phi equal to zero, and this is exactly this this choice we made here. E is the eccentricity of the orbit. If you know the Keplerian problem, then you probably know this parameter. Okay, so that's the Keplerian solution. Okay, in, in the standard perturbative theory, we would then plug in this, this solution over here into this equation, we would obtain the second order solution, uh, the, the equation for the second order problem, and we would deal with that. But we will do something else. Uh, we will take the zero order solution and add an additional parameter here. Cosine omega times phi. Uh, we will call it the new solution. Where omega, well, that's some kind of omega zero plus the first order perturbations, perturbation times epsilon. Uh, yeah, we know that for epsilon equal to zero, this solution has omega equal to one, so we can simply state that this is one. Uh, however, we slightly update our zero order solution by adding an additional parameter we can tune for a final value of epsilon. But why would we want to do it? So let's see what happens in this problem. So this is supposed to be a plot of W and phi. So the blue line represents our unperturbed solution with some kind of period to pi. That will be two pi, that will be four pi, and that would correspond to six pi. Now, what happens if we switch on a finite value of the perturbation epsilon? Well, this will certainly change the shape of this solution. Let's say something of this kind. I'm exaggerating, of course. But that's not the end of the story because it's not guaranteed that the period is going to stay the same. So our new solution is still periodic, but with a different period. That's the, so let me use some color coding. This is W zero omega equal to one. And this thing here is perturbed solution. Uh, because of the mismatch of frequencies, what will now begin to happen is that after each successive orbital uh, period, uh, these, the difference between these two solutions is going to grow. Uh, simply because of the mismatch of frequencies. Uh, if you play a musical instrument, you should be familiar with situations like this. Uh, you've got one string, let's say the fiducial string with some kind of frequency, and you've got another one, which you perturbed, for example, by uh, pressing it with your finger. This will change the shape of the solution or the tone, but it will also affect the frequency a little bit. And in that case, uh, you'll immediately hear the beating effect because of the interference between 
the two sound waves with slightly different frequencies. But now, here's the whole thing of the, here's the whole gist of the Poincaré Lindstedt method. We can react to that. We can take our fiducial string and tune it a little bit for a final value of epsilon in order to uh, counter this effect. So we take our zero of order solution, we introduce a bit of a modification of frequency just to make sure that these two, uh, these two uh, solutions remain in tune. So let me, let me make the same picture uh, if, we con if we consider, if, if we add this omega over here. So in this case, for a finite value of epsilon, uh, we can choose omega in such a way that the perturbed and unperturbed solution remain precisely in tune. That's again the perturbed solution. And that's the W0 mu, provided that we choose this omega appropriately and we'll have to do it. But the bottom line is that if we do it appropriately, there will be no secularly growing difference between these two solutions as the time progresses because they will be periodic with the same period. Okay, so is the idea behind the poincare lindstedt method clear? Or do you have questions to that? Okay. I don't hear any. So we take as, as our zero the solution, we take W zero new rather than W zero. This is perfectly legitimate because look, if we take epsilon equal to zero, we recover exactly our zero order solution uh, unperturbed with this choice of, of the zero order omega. So it's perfectly legitimate to use this thing as our uh, zero order solution rather than this familiar one. The difference is only of the order of epsilon, which we will correct anyway. Okay, so let's try to plug in uh, w equal to w0 mu plus epsilon w1 into this equation here. So we got uh, w0 mu plus epsilon w1 in the same here, second derivative is equal to one minus w0 mu minus epsilon w one plus epsilon and here only the w zero new part matters because the rest is of the order of epsilon squared okay now this thing and this thing taken together satisfy the equation that w zero mu prime minus one plus w zero mu. Well, this is, what. what is this? Okay, let's do it differently. Uh, so this is, uh, This thing here is E minus E omega squared uh, cosine omega phi. Uh, this thing is one minus E cosine omega phi okay so now what we do is to gather the uh, rewrite this equation over here in the following way uh, this is equal to one plus one and here we get minus e cosine omega phi from this guy 
Uh, and here we got the same thing with a minus on the squared. Uh, minus epsilon w one plus epsilon, and we have to plug in this thing over here again. One plus two e cosine squared omega phi plus e squared cosine squared omega phi. Okay, that's pretty much the first equation for the first order. Uh, now we have to plug in the expression for omega. And this would give us this whole expression here. Let me use a different color. The whole expression here is just 1 minus 1 minus 2 omega 1 epsilon. So the constant term goes away. So this thing here is also of the order of epsilon. It's basically minus two omega one epsilon times this thing here. We can go to the next slide or to the next blackboard now. Um, So the equation is now W1 double prime uh, is equal to minus W1 um, plus two Omega one, let me have a look again at the previous solution. Two omega one E cosine. Uh, then we have another term. One plus two e cosine squared plus e squared cosine squared. Yes, that's not. Uh, just for the sake of convenience, this is already a very nice equation for the first order perturbation. Uh, recall that omega is just one plus epsilon omega one, and omega one is still not clear. We, can, we are free, still free to choose our omega one. Uh, but what we want to do first is to write this down in terms of so this thing here is one half one plus cosine two omega phi. We want to use a simple trigonometric identity to simplify this thing here. So again, this is equal to one minus W one, that's this original equation. And then there's an additional, a couple of additional driving terms plus, uh, e square over two, that comes from this one, that's also a constant term, uh, plus e cosine omega phi, two e constant on, e cosine omega phi, one plus, Omega one. This is from these two terms, and then we also have 
e square over half cosine two omega phi. Uh, this is correct. Mm -hmm, that's correct. That's correct. And that's correct. Okay. I like this equation written this way because now it's very clear to it will be much more clear to understand what is going on. So in general, this is again an equation, a linear ordinary differential equation for a harmonic oscillator. So W1, uh, so the second derivative of W1 is minus W1 plus a constant term consisting of one and omega squared. So let's put here, it's the constant driving force, which displaces the uh, equilibrium point to one plus E squared over two. But then there is there are two driving terms with two different frequencies. So there's this, this two omega phi driving term. Uh, this term is harmless. Uh, you can simply solve it by adding by adding something of the type of c times uh, cosine two omega phi plus c two sine two omega phi, and by appropriate choice of uh, C1 and C2, it's possible to deal with this inhomogeneous term. But this term is far more dangerous. Uh, why is it so? Uh, the reason is that this term can lead to a resonance. So when we go with epsilon to zero, uh, the frequency of this oscillator is one. The frequency of this term when epsilon goes to zero also approaches one. So this leads to a resonance. Uh, and resonance produces terms like phi cosine phi, phi sine phi. So terms, uh, if, you have a, a, if you have an oscillator of frequency one, uh, or here we should go with epsilon to zero by the way, so this goes to one. Uh, if we apply this to, 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 to this oscillator over here, uh, we will get resonance and the, and the solution was, is not going to be periodic anymore. What we will see is just a secular growth of the amplitude of oscillations because we've got an oscillator with frequency one and a driving term with frequency one. So this causes the, the solution to be non-periodic unless, and here is the whole point, unless we force omega one to be equal to minus one. Because in that case, this whole term is absent. And if this whole term is absent, then this ODE has purely periodic solutions, just the way we wanted them to be. Let's go back to the previous slide. Right? So if the frequency of the, uh, of the fiducial oscillator, the, the new W0 solution is matches perfectly the uh, frequency of the perturbed oscillator. Uh, the perturbation, the difference between these solutions is purely periodic. There is no non-periodic terms. And that's great. Uh, uh, however, if they are not, there will be secularly growing terms. And now we have found out that in order to kill these growing terms, we have to impose W1 uh, omega one equal to minus one. And of course, after that, we could find, we, we, we could solve this equation uh, and obtain the full uh, value of the perturbed solution, but this is not really relevant. All we need is in fact, this little thing. Because now we know that in order to, to keep our two oscillators in tune, we need to assume that omega is equal to one minus epsilon, right? Because omega one is minus one. And that's all we needed to know here. It's all we needed to know because this means that the period uh, of the oscillations in the angular variable in, the, in this polar angle phi, well, that's equal to two pi over omega, which is equal to two pi over one minus epsilon, which is equal perturbatively two pi plus two pi epsilon. Meaning that the perturbed solution returns to its original value after two pi plus two pi epsilon. 
So let's go back to the plot we had before. So we wanted exactly to know after what angle the solution returns to the to its to the to the same corresponding value, for example, minimum r. Uh, and the difference between this value and the two pi, the Keplerian form, is exactly this uh, angle of precession. Great. We are already there, basically. So this thing here is the precession angle. Perihelion precession angle. Alpha. So alpha is equal to two pi. Now we have to go back and see what epsilon is. It's, it's a dimensionless quantity, but we have to, it has a, a, a definition we introduced some time ago. So epsilon was this thing over here, three gm over p. Uh, and p was l squared over gm small m squared. So this is three GM over P, meaning six pi GM over P. Uh, P is a dimensional quant dimensional quantity. It has the uh, dimension of meters, and it's called semilactus semilactus rectum in in Keplerian orb orbits theory. Uh, it's important just to remember that it's equal to e1 minus e squared. This is from the theory of Keplerian orbits. So it's a way to parameterize the orbit, but more common way to parameterize an orbit is to give the semi-major axis of or a and the eccentricity e. And the relation between those two things is what you see here. Okay. So this is six P GM over E one minus E squared. I'm not proving this relation over here, but it's it's a standard thing in uh, in the Keplerian problem. That this combination is this thing over here. The, uh, semi-major axis of the ellipse of the ellipse and the eccentricity. Okay. Yeah. And in the last step, we can restore the speed of light. Explicitly. So alpha has is dimensionless, it's an angle. However, G uh, requires a small correction. So G, if C is not equal to one, then our old G is G over C squared. We have already used this fact a couple of times. So we have alpha GM over C squared, A Y minus E squared. And that's the perihelion precession. Formula. Uh, we all immediately notice that this effect is proportional to GM over A. So the ratio between the Schwarzschild radius and the size of the ellipse. The bigger ellipse, the smaller perihelion shift or the perihelion precession. Uh, it's also clear that uh, for orbits with larger eccentricity, this is going to be a larger effect. What else? Uh, Yeah, I, I think it's all for now. Let's go back to the lecture. Do you have questions to the derivation of the perihelion precession formula?
it may look a little bit complicated, but it seems to be the easiest method in, in the end. It's a tricky method where we find a relation, a way to, to calculate the frequency of the orbit in the angular variable phi. Oh, there is a question on the chat. Okay, you don't have questions. Good. Let's go. Uh, let's go to, to the last of the lecture. Mm -hmm. And I switch on the pointer. Can you see the pointer? Somehow it doesn't want to switch on. Okay, you can. So those were the geodesics. So this is the formula we have derived. It's a formula for the perihelion precession per a single orbital period. Uh, however, what people very often prefer to use is rather the uh, precession angle per some kind of fixed period, or in other words, the angular frequency of precession. So this angle, in this case, corresponds to full or orbital period, and alpha over t is the angular frequency of the precession or the rotation of the semi-major axis. And there is a couple of ways in which you can massage this formula over here. This is one of them. Uh, I eliminated the period from, from the calculations, but I have also, uh, you can always use the Keplerian relations between the uh, a, a, the semi-major axis, the period and, and GM, uh, in order to get rid of any of, of, of those variables. You can also get rid of GM. The, this formula has also been, been used in the literature. But in the end, the starting point is always this one over here. Uh, if you wonder how big this effect is, again, there's a G over C squared as usual, so it's not a big effect. Uh, however, it was already noticed in, in late 19th century, early 20th century, that uh, the Mercury, the, the, the orbit of the Mercury is undergoing this type of precession, exactly a prograde precession in the direction of, of Mercury's motion. In fact, the precession is much larger than that, uh, but around 500 uh, arc seconds per century can be easily attributed to the influence of other planets of the solar system, which perturb the motion of Mercury. But yet there remained 40 something uh, arc seconds which were unexplained. And it turns out that the GR correction formula, the one over here derived by Einstein, gives a very beautiful, uh, gives exactly value which matches this, uh, this discrepancy very well. It was one of the uh, greatest discoveries and one of the facts that made Einstein very confident regarding his new theory of space-time. So it's a very classical test of GR, one of the first ones ever uh, performed, if not the very first one, and because of that it has pretty important historical value. But not only historical, this effect is observed in many systems, also in the Hall taylor binary pulsar system we talked about. Uh, it has the value of over four degrees per year because this is we are talking about two very heavy objects, um, two neutron stars, uh, and they're on in an, on a very tight orbit and highly elliptical to that. Uh, interestingly, quite recently, people managed to observe this effect in a completely different setting. So, in the center of the Milky Way, there is a very uh, there is a supermassive black hole of of the mass of over four million solar masses. And it's accompanied by a system of stars orbiting this, this, this heavy center. One of the nearest one had uh, one full orbital period around the, the star uh, observed during a longer observation campaign. Uh, and it was determined that it is also undergoing the uh, perihelion shift with appropriate value of about 12 uh, arc seconds per, per orbital period, which is around 16 years. So it's a it's a very common result. It's 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 been noticed in many places in the universe. Okay, that's all. Uh, this is all about perihelion precession. Now the next topic I wanted to cover. The next topic I wanted to cover is the Schwarzschild solution and black holes. Yeah. So let's go back to our notes. So the topic is the R equal to GM singularity is R to the GM surface. Singularities. 
event horizon. So in the last topic of our lecture, I want to tell you a little bit more about the Schwarzschild geometry. Uh, and in particular, I want to convince you that R equal to GM surface is not a true singularity. It's just a coordinate problem we are facing here. But before that, let's have a look again at the form of the Schwarzschild metric. D theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. Uh, so obviously we have a problem at r equal to zero, and we have a problem at r equal to 2gm. Uh, let me go to the appropriate page of my notes. Yeah, so it's easy to, to, to calculate, but we won't do it here because it's a bit of a painful calculation. We can calculate the following so, so, so a singularity in the coordinate in, in, we see in a coordinate system can be of two types. There can be a singularity which is just a coordinate, coordinate singularity, like for example, the R equals zero coordinate singularity in standard spherical system. The singularity, the, the space times, the, the metric seems to have a zero over here, but that's just a question of the spherical coordinates getting weird at, at one single point. But there can be also real singularities. Uh, and one way to distinguish one type from the other is to calculate a scalar, for example, a square of the, the square of the Riemann tensor, and see how it behaves when you approach any of these two potential singularities. So it turns out that this quantity is equal to 40a g squared m squared over r to the power of 6. Uh, if the metric is regular at a point, this must be a finite number, but obviously this is not a finite number as R approaches to zero. So R going to zero seems to be a true singularity, meaning there is no way to define a regular metric at R, metric tensor at R equal to zero, because any regular metric tensor would have to have finite scalar here. Scalars are coordinate independent, even if we play with the coordinates that's not going to change the fact that this thing blows up as we approach r equal to zero. However, there is no uh, problem at r equal to 2gm. So we begin to suspect that this is just a coordinate problem. And it turns out that this is absolutely true. But in order to do it, we have to play a little bit with the coordinates. Uh, so we begin by introducing null coordinates def defined by outgoing and falling uh, null geodesics. So the next topic is radial null geodesics. We are talking about lines which are uh, which are of type of r equals to r of t and they are supposed to be null. Uh, they will represent null geodesics of infalling null particles or, or photons or outgoing photons but uh, we don't but those which are not necessarily parametrized using the uh, affine parametrizations, rather we parametrize them using the external time key. Uh, so the vector one r dot zero zero has to be null in order for this to work. And the condition for this vector to be null is uh, minus one minus r dot is just dr over dt. 1 over 2 gm over r plus 1 minus 2 gm over r minus 1 r dot squared is equal to 0. And this has two types of solutions. r dot is equal to plus or minus dr 1 minus Uh, sorry. Uh, R dot is equal to plus minus one minus two GM over R. And we can integrate this by separation of variables, dr over one minus two gm over r is equal to plus minus 
in T. Depending on the sign, you will get ingoing on or outgoing mm -hmm. geodesics. Uh, okay, uh, we, I will not bother you with solving this step by step. I will just show you the solution. Uh, the solution is simply um, we define something called the tortoise coordinate. It's just a rescaling of the standard R coordinate. R star of R equal to R plus 2M log R over 2M minus one. So that's a new coordinate R star, uh, which is a function of R given by this formula over here, which makes sense for R relative to, sorry, there should be a G here. Uh, it makes sense for R larger than two GM. Uh, when R approaches two GM, then R star approaches minus infinity. When R approaches plus infinity, R star approaches plus infinity. That's how this thing works. Uh, and now the whole thing is that the solution of the of this equation is that T uh, R star of R is equal to T minus T zero or R star of R is equal to minus T minus T zero. That's the solution of this equation over here. So it's written in an implicit form because it's impossible to invert it explicitly. But still, I can make I can show you a few plots. Let's go to lecture fifteen. So here's the R star coordinate versus R. So R star is a coordinate which parameterized is the uh, region from uh, R equals to, to uh, 2 GM up to infinity uh, by taking values from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, so this curve uh, approaches R equal to GM as a uh, vertical asymptote. On the other hand, when we look at large distances, these two coordinates seem to be growing roughly at the same rate. Okay. Uh, I have plotted here a null geodesics, which is first approaching the uh, R equal to GM surface, which separates part of the solution from the second part of the solution. And it seems that it's just asympt asymptotically approaching this surface in these coordinates, but never crosses it. And on the other hand, I also have an infalling, and out, no, sorry, the red one is supposed to be infalling, the blue one is outgoing. There is a mistake over here, sorry for that. Uh, there's also an outgoing one, which sort of asymptotically emerges from R equal to GM and then goes all the way to infinity. And this is a fo radial photon, which moves away from our black hole. And now here's what I want to do. Here's what I will do. I will use this, these uh, now, I will use the photons to, to uh, define new coordinates. So I define u to be equal to t minus r star of r, v to be equal to t plus r star of r. These are new coordinates. And there are now in the sense that you can calculate the square of du du or the square of dv dv and they're equal to zero. Basically u equal to constants gives you uh, outgoing photons, V equal to 
constant gives you info in photons. And now the metric in the new coordinates, I will spare you the exact calculation, but in the end, this Freisig metric has the form of minus one minus two GM over R du dv plus R squared of uv squared d omega squared. And that's it. So here we have R, but we consider R a function of uv given by uh, R star of R is equal to half uh, V minus U. And now this gives you implicitly R as a function of U and V, except that we have to invert this ugly relation between R star and V minus U, which we can do only numerically. So we consider of R, here we consider R not a, 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 a coordinate, but rather a function of U and V given implicitly here. Okay, so in the new coordinates, this is the form of our metric. And let's go to the screen. I will show you what these coordinates look like. Okay, so here you've got the TR plane. And in this, and you can see that the UV coordinates very nicely fill the space between R equal to M and infinity. Uh, since there are no coordinates, these constant U um, lines define also the geometry of the light cones. So let me uh, again switch on the pointer. Yeah, it's here. So you can imagine that these crosses here also define the geometry of the light cones and how the light propagates. And you can see that in the R T coordinates, these light cones tend to close as we approach the R equal to M, uh, the R equal to M to GM uh, surface. And this, uh, this is a part of the geometric problem with this surface. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, convey the, the causal structure or the structure of light cones very well. But we can hand, but it's possible to to deal with that fairly easily, as it turns out. Okay. Uh, so a part of the problem is that going to R to two GM requires going to to V or U going to minus infinity. So the surface we're interested in is at the infinite end of these coordinates, but it turns out that there's a simple way to deal with that. Is you just take a function which sort of brings this infinity to a finite distance. And the proper choice for this function turns to be capital U equals to E minus E to minus U over four M GM and capital V equals to E to small v over 4 gm. Uh, now U equals to infinity and V equals to infinity are in finite distance equal to z capital U equals zero and capital V equal to zero. And you may wonder why we choose this particular set of functions. The only reasonable answer is that it gives the nice form of the final metric. This is the construction of coordinates by uh, I think Hungarian born uh, um, American mathematicians Kuskal and Sekeres performed in 1960, which in a sense gives the best overview of the geometry of the full Schwarzschild metric. It turns out that in these new coordinates, uh, the metric, I will not show you the calculations, takes the form g equal to minus. 32 m to the power of three over r. It's just a coordinate change, something you can you can do yourselves. Minus r of u v um, over two m to g m. Sorry, there's a g to the power of third g m.
du dv plus r of uv squared d omega squared. And here r is defined by the relation r of uv. The old coordinate is e to r over 2gm. Um, sorry, u times v, capital U times v is e to r over 2gm, 1 minus r over 2gm. So again, we have a complicated implicit relation between the old coordinate r and new coordinate uv, but it doesn't matter. It's still a regular function. You can still solve this, this equation for any value of uv, uh, except that Okay, so this is an implicit definition of R, and we see that the metric does not have any problems with singularities, surprisingly, except for R equal to zero. In the very last step, we prefer to use the standard time-like and spatial coordinates instead of two null coordinates. So if we introduce U equals to capital T minus R, V equals to T minus R, T plus R we get more standard type of coordinates. And now the metric becomes G equals to eight M to the power of three over R E to minus R to two G M G three G M minus dt squared plus plus the r squared plus r squared the omega squared and small r is again given by t squared capital t squared minus capital r squared is equal to this function of r which this is again an implicit equation we can always solve for r and here we assume that the coordinates uh, we take only r greater than zero as our space time. Okay, this looks complicated. In, in the very end, I will just show you uh, the uh, plot of the Spartan's space time in these coordinates. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's what the space time looks like in the coordinates capital T and capital R. This is the full Schwarzschild metric. So, the t equal constant, uh, small t equal constant uh, curves are just these straight lines over here. R equal constant are hyper, hyper, hyperbolas, uh, a family of hyperbolas starting from infinity going down to R equal to m, which looks like this cross over here. And then we've got R smaller than m, which hits R equal to zero here. R equal to zero is this hyperbola over here and it's the True singularity. There's not. There's no extension we can make beyond this hyperbola. Uh, in fact, there is not even a continuous extension of spacetime be, be beyond this point. Uh, but we have also another singularity right here in the past, also corresponding to r equal to zero. So the spacetime now consists of four distinct regions. Region number one, which is basically the whole spacetime we know outside the black hole except that we see it in unusual coordinates. So constant time slices look, look like these uh, type of tilting uh, lines. Uh, the R coordinate is hyperbolic. Uh, in these coordinates, T and R, light cons are always light cons. There is no uh, distortion of their shapes. So light basically propagates in the regular direction along lines uh, tilted by 45 degrees, like in the Minkowski spacetime. Uh, this region is separated by a null surface, so surface made of photons, corresponding to R equal to 2gm of, uh, from region 2, which is what we no normally consider the black hole. That's the region with R smaller than, than gm. Here, small r is the time-like coordinate, small t is the spatial coordinate. Whenever any kind of object crosses the, the line R equal, the surface R equal to gm, 
keep in mind that the full spatial metric is four dimensional and each point here corresponds effectively to a whole sphere of radius gm if an object passes this this uh, surface over here which is called the event horizon it reaches it enters the region two and in this region there's no way to escape falling into the singularity r equal to zero remember re remember that in this singularity the curvature or the tidal forces go to infinity so any body which passes through this region eventually is destroyed by infinite tidal forces and which is the singularity in a finite proper time however for an observer who is observing this thing from from infinity this infall phase seems to take infinite time because any body falling through the surface uh, will have to go to t equal to plus infinity so any body falling into this into the surface for an observer outside here will appear to be slowing down slowing down slowing down as it approaches this the surface over here uh, so we the observer will never see the object crossing this the event horizon even though it happens within the finite proper time of the massive particle falling over here it's a bit of a paradox but that's the way it works we also know we established it before that any kind of light emitted by uh, by an observer falling into the black hole so crossing the event horizon will appear gradually more and more it shifted and as a source it will appear dimmer and dimmer so, so sources very close to the event horizon are too dim to be really observed by anybody uh, at infinity any any observer who is not falling into the black hole then there's this region number two where everything gets destroyed after a finite time but it turns out that in these coordinates we have exact copies of regions one and and two uh, with a time reversal symmetry so we've got region four one we can never really access uh, through any kind of causal motions from from region one and there's a region three from which uh, particles seem to be ejected into into region one or four uh, this looks very weird uh, and a bit puzzling but you should remember that the existence of these regions is a bit of an artifact of us using the Schwarzschild solution too literally keep in mind that physical black holes appear because the matter collapses which was not a black hole collapses because of gravitational collapse uh, and the you cannot use the Schwarzschild solution all the way back to uh, back to the past in fact for for a black hole which is formed in a finite time this red diagram looks a bit different we have to replace this whole part of the solution uh, by an appropriate interior solution describing some kind of fluid which first was able to support itself but later for some reason started to shrink if it shrinks too much it cross a horizon develops which traverses this, this interior solution and then goes all the way to infinity separating again events which can which fall into the uh, singularity from those which do not fall into the singularity so the event horizon in general is a surface composed of trajectories of photons which are neither trapped by the blood which neither fall into black hole nor can go to the infinity uh, yeah what we normally consider the black hole is region two where everything uh, that falls in is trapped uh, the regions three and four do not form um, when you consider the interior solution and the whole physics of collapse uh, yes uh, do you have any questions regarding the uh, the full structure of the Schwarzschild solution okay if you don't then a short summary of black holes so black holes in short words are just regions of space-time from which there is no communication with observers at infinity the, the the communication is cut off because of extreme gravity photons cannot escape uh, these regions typically con contain singularities uh, from very far away these type of black holes just look like ordinary massive objects they have some kind of gravitational field which which defines some kind of mass but they don't have any kind of material surface uh, matter can fall into a black hole it's not easy because it's in general it's not easy to fall into a massive black hole in the in, in newtonian gravity 
uh, but in relativity gravity, there is some kind of finite cross section for absorption of matter which falls into the black hole. And anything that falls is trapped. Uh, the black holes are dark, but the matter around a black hole may be hot and visible. It turn, and in fact, quite recently, it was possible to make, uh, using radio astronomy, to make a, a, a very nice imaging of the matter around the black hole uh, and what the, the what this region looks like. Uh, this is known as the black hole shadow. We don't have time to discuss more in detail how this works. Uh, the black holes of stellar masses are believed to, to form from the collapse of cores of very massive stars, which for many reasons cannot support their own gravity. They shrink and past a certain point, they shrink too much across the horizon, event horizon develops and the whole uh, object turns into a black hole. Uh, it's believed that stationary and rotating black holes are described by Schwarzschild solution, but if there is an angular momentum, then the correct solution is called the Kerr solution. Uh, it contains an additional correction because of the of the spin of the interior black hole. Uh, we did not have time to talk more about that. Okay, and that's the final slide.